Gary Davis. I'm with Intel. I'm the Chief Consumer Security Evangelist. Um, as uh, Ken said, my job's probably going to be to, to scare the crap out of you a little bit. Just before I go down that path, though, I want to let, let everybody know that I'm a big fan. If you look at my, myself, you look at my home, you look at the, my business, we are a big fan of the whole idea of, of the connected enterprise, the connected home, to make sure everything works together. But there's an ugly, uh, there's an ugly underbelly to all this, and it's kind of my job to make sure we understand what those guys are thinking, and hopefully educate and inform you a little bit, so you can be building better products that will allow you to, to make sure that that you don't wake up one morning, a headline in the New York Times saying you've been breached or something bad happened happens. Um, first of all, I think it's important to note that cybercrime is a massively big business, right? There's estimates that suggest it's anywhere between 300 billion and a trillion dollars. Um, I rounded at 500 billion, trying to you know, kind of break it between the two. Um, there's a study that was put out last year that suggested that the return on investment for the average piece of malware is about 1,425%. So there's, there's really not a lot of motivation for, for the bad guys not to do what they do, right? Because if you think about it, most of the attacks are really being executed by people that it's difficult to prosecute. If somebody launches a malware attack and does a breach and they're doing it uh, in the basement, in the underwear, in some place in Estonia, it's gonna be kind of hard for all the different law enforcement agents, agencies to sink and, and try to get a line and go figure out how we go get this bad guy. So it was difficult to prosecute borders. The fact that there's a lot of money to be made doing this, there's really not a lot of impetus for them not to do the bad things they do. And if you think about what's happening today, recall, uh, what was it, 20, or 2014 was a year of the retail breach. You know, you remember Home Depot, you remember Target, all these retailers had all this point of sale malware and it was all over the news and you had massive impact to their, to their earnings per share, people lost their jobs. But then what happened as we went into 2015 is the bad guys, or, or the, the, the ability for the credit card companies to detect fraudulent behaviors on credit cards got so good that the value of that credit card went down to a buck or two. So, so the, ROI on having that breach credit card and the amount of time that that credit card was useful really dried up. Um, so last year they really changed, the bad guys changed their focus and decided we need to go find out where we can get the mother load of data. And what they really focused on last year was really, you know, health companies. And that last year there was breach after breach after breach where all this health healthcare information was, was, was put out there. And the reason why is because the data included in there is stuff that's really, really hard to change. You can't change your social security number, you can't change your date of birth, it's hard to change your address. And these are the type of factors, the type of personally identifiable information that the bad guys use to do things like insurance fraud, identity theft, things, things like that. So they really shifted from focusing on credit cards to your trying to get after PII. But a fun fact, just in the past couple weeks, um, if you've been watching the security news, you know, Wendy's had a point of sale malware attack. I think it aff affected something at 1,000 of their stores. And uh, Omni Hotels also had a big you know, point, of sale, point of sale malware breach. So we continue to see stuff going on in retail, but, but the, the, the value of those cards is greatly diminished. In fact, last year it got so bad that the, the bad guys actually started doing predictive, predictive analysis on what the replacement credit card would be. So they'd breach a credit card, get the number, they would figure out what the bank would use as the replacement number and use that as, as the, the, the thing that they would use to try to, to, to get something bad to happen. So it's, it's crazy time. Um, so with the, the idea that, that you know, there's, there's, it's, it's a very lucrative environment for the bad guys to do what they do, and we think about what's coming with, 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 with all the devices and 5G coming around 2020, um, the data here seems to be pretty solid. You know, I've seen estimates that say that the number of connected devices between, will be between 20 billion and 200 billion by 2020. But as we, as we get closer and closer to 2020, it feels like 50 billion is about right. The number of sensors is going to be about 202 billion. And most of the data, the 47% of the data that moves back and forth is going to be machine to machine. Let me illustrate a little bit about 
just what we mean by this, because I think a lot of people get confused. Isn't, every, isn't a sensor a connected device? Look at a car. A car today has 15 to 20 different sensors, and all those sensors are, are sharing information with the car, and then that car ultimately sends that information someplace in the cloud. Uh, last October, I bought a new car. I was playing golf with a buddy. I think it was in March. And about halfway through the game, I get an email saying I had a flat tire. I thought, wow, that's pretty intuitive. But sure enough, finished the golf game, walked to my car, and my tire was flat. So this is a great example of, of IoT doing some of the goodness, but it was a sensor in that car that, that connected to my car that went to my service provider, which told me that I had a flat. Well, fun fact on that. Um, you cannot patch run flat tires, which is a major bummer, and it ended up costing me 560 bucks to get the, get the tire replaced. That kind of sucked, but it was really, really cool to, to walk off or to get that email and say, well, I got a flat tire, except when it happened to be really a flat tire, then it wasn't so cool. So if you, if you look at all the centers in, in a car today, this is today, and you think about what's going to happen by 2020, and you think about the amount of data that's going to be flowing. For example, today, the average consumer um, goes through about 650 megabytes of data a day. You know, and that's a lot of different things being factored in. It's you're streaming a movie, streaming uh, audio, you know, all sorts of things. There's just a lot of content moving around. But right today, the average consumer goes through about 650 megabytes of, of data a day. By 2020, the average consumer will be going through about 1.5 gigabytes of data. And then you look at what happens when you start introducing these connected devices, which are hyper-connected. Self-driving cars, 4,000 gigabytes of data per day per car. Connected planes, all those sensors on all the planes, 40,000 gigabytes of data per plane per day. The connected factory, 1 million gigabytes of data per day every day. So we have this, this massive tide of, of, of data coming at us, and the bad guys are out there thinking, what do I do with all this data? I, I love rich data, I know that data is my friend, and I can go start doing stuff with this data and make bad things happen. Let's talk a little bit about history, specifically in the security space. Um, Microsoft, when they, when they brought out Windows back in 1990, their go-to-market plan was to get on as many devices as possible. Right, and they're hugely successful. I mean, they dominate the, the world today as far as the devices we use having windows on them. If you, think what hap if you watch what happened in the security space today, we have 560 million malware samples, most of that targeting Microsoft. We find 305 new samples every minute of every day. That's about five new samples every second of every day. So this, what Microsoft did in order to go grab all that, that, that share, they really had to forego some of the security you know, requirements in order to really lock down their environment. Fast forward to Android. Look at Android today. Right now we have, in our zoo, we have about 9 million malware samples. Uh, we saw a 137% year-over-year increase in malware targeting Android. And I'm gonna talk a little bit later about some of the things that happened just this past week that will probably you know, get your attention a little bit. And then we fast forward to IoT, and we're finding just a massive dearth in any meaningful security controls or technology being applied as the devices come on in mass. And to illustrate this point, last year, HP issued research and looked at the top 10 devices connected in the home. They found that on average, on average, those devices had 25 vulnerabilities each. And this is stuff that as a security practitioner makes your skin crawl. You know, for example, they, they, weren't, they weren't sending the data over an encrypted channel. They weren't requiring a password reset. They weren't requiring complex passwords. Excuse me, the, the websites they're they were spinning up to, to allow their consumers to come in and engage with their data had all sorts of, of security vulnerabilities, cross-site scripting, all sorts of things. So the, the data that was coming in mass was easily accessible for the bad guys to go do bad things with. So uh, another illustration at this point, I, I was in a panel in San Francisco last year and one of the guys on the panel talked about a connected light bulb 
that was broadcasting the Wi-Fi password in clear text. So imagine walking by somebody's office or the home, also, I mean, you can go get these devices any place, and, and, and all of a sudden you're seeing a, broad, a Wi-Fi being broadcasted, and any bad guy knows the second you have that password, you can tunnel to the gateway, then you can go downstream to any device in there and really do whatever you want. I mean, we do this all the time. The second you have a, 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 a viable tunnel into a device through that type of connection, the type, type of havoc you can, you can draw, you can do, is pretty substantial. So, yeah, we're, by, by, we, we hypothesized on why somebody thought it was a good idea to create an IoT light bulb that would, would broadcast a Wi-Fi password, and the only thing we could, could come to it must have been a coding error. But nonetheless, it shows you how little attention was being given to making those devices secure. So when we think about, and I could literally spend, I have 15 minutes, I could spend a whole hour just on this one slide and talk you through um, the, the whole ecosystem for IoT. You know, in this case, I talk about a wearable device. You know, most of the wearable devices today are connecting to your smartphone. That smartphone is connecting to a server in the cloud. And from a, a security perspective, every point along this journey is easily exploitable, really easily exploitable. For example, most of the time, and I'm not doing it today, but a lot of times when I'm giving this speech, I actually have my Samsung phone in my pocket, and I'll have a, Wi-Fi, a Bluetooth sniffer going, so I'm sniffing every device in the room, and then at the end of the speak, I'll show the type of devices I found and I explain the type of attacks, or the types of things I could do with the data, everything from stalking to man-in-the-middle attacks to redirects and all sorts of stuff like that. So, and, and that's just a, a, blue, a connected Bluetooth device. Um, if you think about what's going on, and, and there's really two things that, that, that we need to think about when this happens. One is the data at rest. How's that data manifesting itself as it rests on whatever device that's sitting on or wherever it sits? and what's being done to safeguard that, and what's being done to protect that data as it moves. Because both of those are areas of weakness that we readily exploit in the security industry. When I think about the, the thing that I think is, is the weakest link in this whole ecosystem, to me it's a smartphone. Because today, everything we have goes to the smartphone. For, with my smartphone, I can open the front door of my house, I can open my car, I can start my car, I have all my banking data, I have all my, uh, connected, my connection data. I mean, everything is going through that phone. And the, the level of, of, of lack of, of, of concern that consumers have for what's going on that device is, is, is pretty shocking to us in the security space. For example, in this room today, if you, if you look to your left and you look to your right, one of you doesn't have your phone pin protected. That simple. So. 22, only 22% of you install software that allows you to find your phone if it's lost. And oh, by the way, this is a free service available from your carrier and from your operating system company. So why, we can't figure out why people don't turn this on. Um, only 14% install third-party security apps. Um, I find this very alarming, first of all, because of the, the pervasiveness of malware targeting those, targeting those devices today and more important, the number of um, other features that really help for a safer use of that device. For example, most of the software vendors have uh, the ability to let you know if you're about to connect to a Wi-Fi that's not secure. Right? Maybe it's a spoof Wi-Fi hotspot or something like that. So it'll tell you, hey, do you want to connect to this? Because if you connect to this, something bad could really happen. Just so you know, a couple years ago, we were at our user group in Las Vegas, and we actually showed how we could set up a a um, mock Wi-Fi hotspot. We took the, the top broadcasting free Wi-Fi hotspot. I think it was over at the, uh, the Palazzo, and everybody started connected to it. And then we showed how we could tunnel in, and the, the use case that we showed was tunneling it into an iPad over that connection. So that's just how simple it is for somebody to use something in, from a Wi-Fi perspective. Only 8% of consumers install software that will erase the phone's data. If I, if I lose sight of my phone, I'm gonna brick it in about three seconds. I don't care if it did cost me 700 bucks for that phone, the value of the data on that phone far outweighs the, the, value, the cost of the phone. We did a survey a couple years ago and we asked, I forgot how many consumers, I wanna say about 10,000 around the world, and they said the average value of the data that sits on their phone 
was $38,000. And that was everything, all in, everything from pictures of the newborn to work product to the music library and you name it, but $38,000. Consumers highly value that data, but yet they do very little to protect that data. And finally, only 7% use readily available security features such as screen lock and encryption. So basically, if I was to take anybody's phone in here, it would take, be a matter of minutes for me to, to, to connect that device to a computer and basically get all the information on it. I'd have it out there before we even knew what happened. It's that simple. So what's going on in, in, in the, in the why, why do I, I, I have such a keen focus on mobile devices? <clears throat> Last year, um, there was this announcement of this it's a vulnerability called stage fright. Basically, it was a weakness in the media, media controls on Android devices. Um, basically, it was so simple to exploit, you could send somebody an MMS message that would automatically run on the device. It could root that phone, and then that person tunneling in could take total control of that device. It was found that some 900 million devices were vulnerable to that type of attack. 900 million Android devices. That was last year, by the way. It was a big, big news cycle about that. Um, last week, there's a malware called Hummingbad. Uh, we found 10 million uh, Android uh, devices affected by it. Same thing, it's basically allowing people to root the phone and take total control of the phone and the consumer has no idea what's going on. Um, if every, anybody heard about that new game that's getting a lot of traction right now called Pokemon Go, where basically you go around and find a, yeah, there's, you find a Pokemon characters. Uh, first of all, there's been some fatal, fatalities associated with that where people aren't paying attention and get hit by cars, so just be careful. But we also found a, a sideload version of Pokemon Go for those consumers that, that were anxious to get it and could it for whatever reason, all sort of infected with malware and bad things are happening. So the bad guys are making it, are getting to the devices at a rate that, that makes it really scary and very accessible for bad things to happen. So some things we can do about mobile devices, this is kind of general knowledge, things, you know, you should be do pin or password protected device, I think that's pretty much a no brainer. Um, I think we're quickly getting to the point where using things like multi-factor authentication and biometrics as a replacement for passwords is gonna happen. If you look what happens, every week or so there's a breach. Every time there's a breach, the top 10 passwords never change. So there's, there's a big um, effort within the industry to do away with passwords, right? Basically going to the point where the devices today are smart enough and have enough sensors to, to, to with a high degree of accuracy, know that you are who you say you are and understand what permissions you have to go do. So we feel we're about five years away from getting away from password altogether. So when you, when you put, basically hold your device up, the device knows either through a biometric or through other sensor technology, who you are and what you have the right to do and then we, used, we, we pass tokens back and forth instead of using in passwords to allow transactions to happen, either e-commerce, banking, or, or whatever. So I think we're gonna get there pretty quickly. Uh, permissions. Gaming in particular is really, really bad about trying to take over every single permission. And they quite frankly, they don't need it. Why one of your games need access to your call log, to your contacts, just doesn't make sense. So be really careful about the permissions that these apps are, are are trying to take advantage of. Um, you know, one of the things we, we talked before about the, those 900 million devices that were, were vulnerable to the stage fright, um, basically it was fixed pretty quickly, but the big challenge, especially with, with Androids, is the, the amount of time it takes for a patch to get rolled out to a phone is a very long time, and then it's really hard to get consumers to actually apply that patch in a timely manner, so that gives the bad guys a really long time to determine what's going on and what they can do to, 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 do, to, do, to do harm to that device. Turn on lock and locate, um, you know, turn off non-essential antennas, use disk encryption, and you know, use trusted stores. A lot of the malware that we're seeing getting onto phones today is, is getting because they're not using Google Play or some of the other trusted stores out there. In fact, in our last uh, quarterly threat report, there was, I think we said there was nine million uh, samples of malware targeting Android, particularly today, we found 34 million instances of malware on all the different app stores. It's obviously samples of that 9 million being rendered over and over again, but nonetheless, there's a lot of malware that gets out there in mass into the app stores. 
So the, the real crux of this discussion is what happens when 5G hits and IoT accelerates. We've, we see a couple things happening from a security perspective. First of all, the, the, the ongoing challenge with companies continuing to focus on time to market and convenience is really going to impact security because you're going to have these devices that are going to connect with at hyper-connected speeds. So the ability for the bad guy to use a rogue device to get access to a network or something like that and take the data out at an extremely high rate, bad things can happen before people even know what's going on. So the fact that we're going to have some 50 billion connected devices by 2020, and we're going to have 5G, which is going to have this extraordinary ability to, to, to drive connectivity the way we've never seen it before, our fear is that it's going to open up this massive Pandora's box, and a lot of really, really bad things are going to happen just because of the ability for, you know, the, the lack of the ability for companies to know what's going on with all the connected devices, the device is going to connect, a hole is going to be built, somebody's going to exploit that hole, and they're going to start pulling the data out at speeds we've never seen before. Kind of illustrate this a little bit. I'm not sure if you know this, but um, one of the big reasons why people are all excited about driverless cars is they get to take a nap when they're driving. All right. Uh, fun fact, last week or two weeks ago was the first fatality of uh, Tesla has this automation mode. I, I don't really understand what it is, but apparently it allows you to, it's almost as close to a driverless car as you can get to that. Apparently that guy or gal or whatever was watching Harry Potter and then the accident occurred. But we see a time, imagine where you're on the strip here and you're taking a nap in your car because you think that's the right thing to do when you're in a driverless car and all of a sudden your car stops in the middle of the highway or in the middle of, of the strip out here and you're held up for ransom and say this car is not going to move until you pay us a ransom. This is not science fiction. This is stuff that, that, that the ability to do it exists today and the bad guys are figuring out how to do it as we speak. You recall there was a big news cycle last year, I think it was Jeep, that um, somebody went in through the cell connection and basic, basically took total control of the Jeep while somebody was driving it. That's not science fiction. That's the kind of stuff that's been plaguing our industry for several years and, and represents one of the big challenges we, say, we see as we have more and more connected devices with, with the companies who are bringing those devices to market without giving proper consideration to security. What do we need to do as an ecosystem? Um, I would encourage all of you that are manufacturing devices, building IoT connected devices, think about security as, as a starting point, not, not an afterthought. If you, build it in, if you build it in advance, we believe that that's going to be a means for you to differentiate based on being a good security practitioner. Um, I know you want to get those devices out there quickly. I know that you have you know, demands from your boss to say we need to be realizing revenue from that. But the last thing you want to do is be a headline in the paper realizing that your device got out there in mass and all of a sudden you've exposed all your consumer data to a bad actor and, and bad things happen. By the way, the, the, the impact of brand value of a company that's been breached and have this data go out in mass is between 180 and $330 million. So it takes some pretty deep pockets to really defend if something bad happens and that data gets out there in mass. Let's talk about the ultimate wearable hack. A couple years ago, again, at our, our user group here in Vegas, um, we took a regular laptop computer and a directional antenna, I think it was from Radio Shack, and we actually demonstrated how you could take con total control of an insulin pump. And by total control, you could turn it on, you could turn it off, you could change the dosage. You could actually drain the device into the recipient. And for those of you that that understand what happens in that case is the patient goes terminal, I want to say within something like 10 minutes, if that happens. Think about what's happening today. This is a, um, a patent that Google has applied for, basically controlling your eye, right? That bottom right where you see that little lightning bolt, that's your, basically that implant in your eye talking, into your, talking to your smartphone. About a month ago, I went up to see my brother and I was talking to his wife and she has hearing aids, masterful. You can't even tell she has them in there so small. And she was so excited about these hearing aids and that she could control them with her phone. And God is my witness. The first thing I started thinking is, okay, here's how I could hack into your, into your hearing aid. 
right? So that's, a, that's how you know, people in my industry think. They don't think about, oh, it's a great thing that you're, getting, take, you're using to help you do something. We think about, okay, here's how we could use that to really impact you in a negative way. I, w I was on another panel last year, and um, one of the guys was all excited. He was developing a technology which would turn, turn all the sensors on your phone on. GPS, the, the, um, the camera, the, uh, the microphone, every sensor on the device being just turned on. And I, and I asked him, well, have you thought about the privacy implications of that? And he looked at me like I had three heads. Like, what do you mean privacy? Everybody wants this. I don't know if everybody's gonna want that. Anyways, um, we, we have a lot of challenges that we think are coming. Um, I would encourage you to, to really think hard as you build your, your IoT devices and make sure that you're building security in from the start. Uh, if you don't, I, I fear that you may be a consequence. And with that, I have about a minute if there's any questions. Just raise your hand and I'll come yes, on sir. over with the mic. Hold on, wait for the microphone. We want people to hear you. Yeah, people think they can. Thank you very much for that. Um, Quick question. I, I read a lot about this stuff all the time and, and the technological solutions to countervailing all these, uh, the bad guys. What I never read about, and I'm wondering if you can comment that on, is, are there, is there any effort at all to try to catch these guys, to go after them, find them where they live? Yeah. And we, we work with law enforcement all the time. Matter of fact, uh, last year we, we took out a, a big uh, botnet called BNOT, or BBOT, um, and we took that down. We worked with Interpol and I want to say it was a, the, uh, the London police or something like that. Fun fact, as part of our, so we, we helped determine what the servers and directed the law enforcement to go get the servers and, and capture the bad guys. When we were in there, you know, pulling all the, 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 the data, we found um, the record of this, this guy in Norwich, uh, England of all places. So we, we, we go to this guy's house and we knock on his door and we're with, we're with the police. Not, not, we're not doing our own, we're there with the police. We knock on his door and, and say, are you, you know, John Smith? Yeah, um, uh, we just took down this, this botnet and here's what we found out about you. And literally it had everything about him ever. Every username, password, mother's main name, every security question, everything about him that could identify him, everything was there. And, and he, he looked like a deer in the headlights and he said, and this just done this, what do I do? You know, and that's really the, 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 the reason why it's so important that we, we get our hands around this before the data continues to proliferate, because if we don't lock it down, if we don't do a good job of securing the data, encrypting it, and doing all the, the sensible security controls to make it really work well, then stuff like this is gonna happen and, and, and we'll never be able to, to, to thwart all the efforts of all the bad guys. Folks, a round of applause for Gary Davis, please. Thank you.